I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that clear anybody to see I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not Welcome to Brains Matter This is episode 16 for the 7th of February 2007 I'm the ordinary guy and I'll bring you stories on science curiosities knowledge and anything else that's interesting On today's show you hear about the new Windows Vista operating system, a brain teaser, Valentine's Day, Kin of the Week, and I'll bring you some of the latest news in the world of knowledge. Microsoft has released the latest version of Windows for home and business desktop PCs and called it Vista. They've made grand claims as to its security and capability, but most of the world seems to have been underwhelmed by their claims. The Australian Consumer Association's Choice magazine put the new operating system under a barrage of tests, and their conclusions are probably not something Microsoft would like to have read. According to Choice, They were able to crack the firewalls and other systems that Microsoft had upgraded in Vista over XP, although it was harder to do so than in XP. They also found that for the same hardware, it was considerably poorer in performance than other operating systems, including XP. And the claims that Microsoft have made about it being the most secure operating system to date, well, they're probably having a bit of a lend. It isn't even the most secure Microsoft operating system ever made. That title belongs to the operating system that powers the Xbox consoles. But other operating systems such as Apple's OS X, the various Unix and Linux derivatives such as NetBSD and so forth, have had the same or better security features which Microsoft have just introduced into Vista for a long time. So what was the conclusion from choice? For the money that you have to fork out to upgrade to Vista, it's not worth it. They recommend waiting until you buy a new PC, which would automatically give you Vista pre-installed in most cases anyway. It's not really worth the hassle of spending money to upgrade to Vista on most current machines, because it would entail a hardware upgrade for those computers. And despite the fact that the user interface is far more Macintosh-like and user-friendly, which OS X has had for about five versions of the operating system anyway. It doesn't really give you anything you can't do if you're currently using XP anyway, and some applications break under Vista, which may work perfectly well under XP. They suggested that people either stay with XP for now, or look at other operating systems, such as open source platforms like Linux, or other proprietary operating systems such as OS X. Microsoft has also fallen foul of DSL users in Australia. They didn't provide drivers to Australia's biggest DSL providers, Telstra and Optus, so people on Telstra or Optus DSL or cable internet connections have been reported to have lost their ability to connect to the internet if they start using Vista. Microsoft have since apparently promised to give Telstra and Optus these drivers soon, although I don't know how soon soon really is. And for those users who are iTunes users, Apple has recommended that you wait before upgrading to Vista because Vista doesn't work too nicely with iTunes. Apple's website suggests that this issue will be resolved in the next week or so. I'm glad I don't have to worry about being forced to upgrade to new operating systems before I want to. I'm one of those 5% of people in the world who use a Macintosh. There's a saying in the IT world, the difference between Windows and Mac OS is that every new version of Windows runs slower and every new version of Mac OS runs faster. And it's true. You can get a 10 year old Macintosh and without upgrading it, run the latest operating system. But you wouldn't dream of getting a Pentium 2 without upgrading it and trying to install Windows XP or let alone Vista on it and trying to use that without getting frustrated. And for the record, I've had a Commodore 64 
PCs running Windows 3.0, 3.1, NT4, Windows 2000, Windows XP, OS2 version 2, OS2 version 3, BOS, Slackware Linux, Mandrake Linux, Ubuntu Linux, and the Macintosh running OS X Panther, so I'm not really biased from a familiarity aspect. I may, however, be biased from a reliability aspect. And now it's time for today's brain teaser. Who coined the phrase, survival of the fittest? Have a think about it, and I'll give you the answer later in the show. Valentine's Day is upon us yet again, the 14th of February, only a week away. So for those who celebrate it, you'd better start making plans or think about what you're going to buy for your partner if you haven't already done so. It's not just another commercial holiday, although a lot of people do claim it is. It does have origins from days gone by. In ancient Rome, the 14th of February was a holiday to honour the goddess Juno, was the goddess of women and marriage. February the 15th was a festival named the Feast of Lupercalia. This is where the names of Roman girls were written on slips of paper and placed into jars. Single young men would draw a girl's name from the jar and they would be partners during the festival. Sometimes these pairings would last to the following year's festival and often they'd fall in love and marry. Various legends surround St Valentine's including one which states that the saint performed marriages despite a Roman emperor's ruling that men had to remain single because it was his view that married men made poor soldiers for the Roman army. Valentine continued to marry people and as a result was thrown into prison and executed on the 14th of February 269 AD. It's been claimed that Pope Gelasius declared February 14th as a special holiday in honour of St. Valentine in 469 AD. Another tradition is one where English women in the 18th century used to write men's names on scraps of paper and each piece of paper would be rolled into a piece of clay. The pieces of clay were then all dropped into some water and the first paper to rise to the surface of the water supposedly contained the name of that particular woman's true love. And for those who turn their nose up at Valentine's Day, have you heard of Penny Dreadfuls? Penny Dreadfuls are another tradition where, from the 19th century onwards, Penny Dreadfuls, or Vinegar Valentines, became very popular. It was where cards were printed on cheap paper and featured crude images and insults. They cost a penny, and you sent it to people you didn't like. And of course, the recipient had to pay the passage for you. And now it's time for the pin of the week. Today's pin of the week goes to Trevor from Australia. Thanks for adding to the frap on that, Trevor. If you want to be part of the pin of the week, it's easy. Just put a pin into the frap map with your name and location, which is listed on the website, and you automatically become eligible.
And now it's time for the answer to the brain teaser. Who coined the phrase, survival of the fittest? If you answered Charles Darwin, you're wrong. Even though the phrase is mentioned a lot when people are talking about Darwinism, it wasn't a phrase that originated with good old Charles. It was actually coined by an English sociologist, Herbert Spencer, who lived from 1820 to 1903. It describes the process by which creatures or organisms that aren't as well adapted to their environment tend to die out, and better adapted organisms tend to survive. So what's been happening in the world of knowledge? Well, the women's spacewalk record's been broken. The record for the total amount of time spent for a female to walk in space was 21 hours by an American woman named Catherine Thornton. And this record was beaten by Indian-American astronaut Sunitha Williams, who beat that record last Sunday. In total, her spacewalks totaled 22 hours and 27 minutes. Almost everyone has heard of Wikipedia by now. Many businesses use wiki technology as well. Wikis allow anyone to edit entries, and sites such as Wikipedia allow people from anywhere who register with a site to add, change, or even to delete an entry. And many of you out there have a creative bent, or want to write a novel and become the next J.K. Rowling. Now there's an opportunity to do so. Well, not completely, but to write part of a novel. Now there's a wiki novel available, and it's called A Million Penguins, and you can find it at www.amillionpenguins.com. The British publisher Penguin are hoping that a collaborative web-based novel will be something of a glimpse into the future. It'll be interesting to see how it fares, and if it ends up with a great story, or one of those classroom-style finish-the-story exercises that end up with totally nonsensical plot lines, if it ends up having one at all. Children who can speak more than one language can, in their older years, delay the onset of dementia, according to some research into bilingualism and old age cognitive impairment. The mental agility used to think in more than one language and manage the separate communication channels regularly through life appear to enhance the brain's ability to adapt and improve the blood flow to various regions within the brain, which delays the usual decline in cognitive ability. Professor Ellen Bailey Stock from York University in Toronto examined just under 200 patients with cognitive conditions between 2002 and 2005, and after analysing various data, including the background of the patients, found that bilingual and multilingual patients began to show signs of developing dementia at 75.5 years of age, compared to those who only spoke one language, who showed the same signs at an average of 71.4 years of age. So if you only know one language, and computer languages don't count, go out and learn one today. No doubt you've seen the reports in the science media around the so-called Hobbit, an 18,000-year-old species which many believe to be closely related to Homo sapien, but much smaller in size, on the island of Flores in Indonesia. There's been a lot of controversy since the discovery of a cave with bones of this hominid, but some scientists claim it was just Homo sapien, affected with microcephalic syndrome or a deformation of a normal Homo sapien. Scientists at the University of Florida recently examined computer models of the skulls of the Flores hominid and determined that the brain was well formed and not, as some have argued, an abnormal skull. 
the conclusion was that it was a human-like creature, just on a smaller scale. Some have claimed that this would make sense from an evolutionary perspective, since the species would have been living on a small island with finite resources, so it would not have been advantageous to grow to larger sizes. These findings are published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and states that the specimen had a highly evolved brain and didn't show signs of being diseased. Indonesian officials had blocked access to the cave since about 2005 after a disagreement between the Australian and Indonesian scientists who originally made the discovery. There were even allegations of the bones being stolen, all the hallmarks of a good midday movie. But now it appears that the Indonesian officials have allowed excavations to restart at the cave. Just to give you an idea of what the hobbit looked like, it was about a metre tall, it had a brain capacity equivalent to a chimpanzee, which is around 400 cubic centimetres, but seemed to possess a high level of intelligence from the sophisticated tools that were found nearby. It also had long arms and other features which appear to indicate that it may have commonalities with Homo erectus, Homo habilis, or even Australopithecus. There have been arguments for years about the effects of mobile phones on people's health. There were fears, just there were with a microwave oven when it first came out, that the radiation emitted by a mobile phone could possibly be harmful to people. There was an incident last year that appeared in the Australian press where around six people developed cancer, all academics who worked on the top floor of the Tivoli building of RMIT University in Melbourne. What did they have in common? Aside from the fact they all worked on the top floor of the building, the roof of the building housed mobile phone towers. There was a lot of speculation that they had been the cause of all the people developing cancer in a similar time period, but the health officials came in to check it out and stated that the signals were within acceptable levels and were probably not the cause of the cancer, however coincidental it might have appeared. Just recently, a study to be published in the International Journal of Cancer found that people who had used their mobile phones for 10 years or longer were 40% more likely to develop tumours called colomas in their nervous system directly in the area near where they hold their mobile phones. It's not the first study to make this suggestion. Other studies, of course, have shown that there is no connection between tumours and the usage of a mobile phone. Maybe there is a price of staying connected in today's world. Well, that's the end of Brains Matter for today, the 7th of February 2007. You're welcome to contact me either via email at mail at brainsmatter.com or through the website by commenting on the story at www.brainsmatter.com. You'll also be able to find the episode's transcript on the website. The, the transcript actually has some extra links to other stories of interest as well. Please leave comments and vote for the podcast in Podcast Alley. If you already voted last month, be sure to vote this month as well. You can also vote for the podcast and comment in iTunes or dig.com. I'll leave you with a quote from Anna Sewell. I'm never afraid of what I know. I hope you enjoyed the show. Bye for now. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that's clear anybody to see. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I clever I would be. I'm not half as clever as me.